Hollywood, California, Monday, May 10th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Crawford and Francho Tone in Mary of Scotland with Judith Anderson. Lux presents Hollywood, starring Joan Crawford, Francho Tone, and Judith Anderson. And as guest of honor, the head of one of the oldest houses in English nobility, the Earl of Warwick. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. These performances come to you through the courtesy of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap. And may we thank you for your enthusiasm for this fine soap, which, of course, makes the Lux Radio Theater possible. Now, I am sure you have all heard men say something like this. Pretty? No, not exactly. But let me tell you something. Boy, she's got a way with her. There's something about her that sort of gets you. When a man talks that way about a girl, you can be sure she's learned the secret of being really attractive to men. That skillful and beautiful little screen star, Betty Davis, says this. You girls who want to be popular, here's something to remember. A man was never born who could resist the charm of perfect daintiness. The least fault against it just ruins illusions, spoils romance. The easiest, most delightful way I know to protect daintiness is to bathe with Lux toilet soap. The active lather leaves skin really sweet, fragrant with the delicate perfume you'll love. Try it. I turn our microphone over to Hollywood's celebrated producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The climax of tonight's play was created exactly 350 years ago. When in 1587, emissaries from the English crown entered the great hall of the castle of Fotheringay and read to a woman named Mary the memorable orders of Queen Elizabeth. Termed the most eloquent historical romance drama of our time, the story you will hear is the work of Maxwell Anderson. It brings us through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Joan Crawford in the title role, and Francho Tone as Bothwell, while Judith Anderson will portray Queen Elizabeth. Joan is one of the most earnest actresses in Hollywood. The next picture in which she will star with Spencer Tracy is named Three Rooms in Heaven. From Cornell University, Francho Tone went immediately to the stage. We in Hollywood know him not only as a fine actor, but as one of our most civilized, charming, and best-liked neighbors. He comes to you shortly on the screen in MGM's They Gave Him a Gun. In Judith Anderson, Broadway lends us one of its greatest dramatic actresses. Last seen in Hamlet... The Old Maid, and Come of Age. Now, back through history. Back to the kingdom of the north, to Scotland. Land of lakes and heather, of peabrocks and blue bonnets and bagpipes, of tartan and tam o' shanter. Back to a day when one throne stood in Edinburgh and another in London. Back to romance, as the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Crawford and Francho Tone with Judith Anderson in Mary of Scotland. Scotland, in the year 1561, from France across the angry waters of the North Sea, Mary Stuart comes unheralded to take her rightful place upon the throne as Queen of Scots. It's a stormy midwinter night. On the pier at Leith, Scotland, two soldiers huddle in a corner seeking shelter from the wind and freezing rain. The Earl of Bothwell walks quickly along the pier and, stepping from the shadows, addresses them sharply. Leg it over to the inn, one of your lads, and fetch a chair. What on God him, my lord? Curse your guard duty. The Queen of Scotland stepping out of a boat in velvet shoes. I doubt there's a chair nearer than Edinburgh, Tom. There's one at the Leith Inn, as you well know. Would not the silver for that in any case. What the devil do you mean by haggling over a dirty chair? Seize it. Seize it in the Queen's name. I'll fetch it, sir. And you go with him. I will, my lord. The Queen of Scotland with her velvet shoes. We want none of her here. A very broad evening to you, Master Knox. And to you, Lord Bottle. It seems some here have heard of her coming, though not perhaps those she'd have chosen. You're not here by chance to greet Mary Stuart. If I had aught to say to her, it will be for her own ears. No doubt. 
And I have a little observe to make to you about that too, sir. I'm no such fool as to try to muzzle a minister. Nevertheless, whatever it was you were going to say, you won't say it. That's my observe to you. I shall say what I have come to say. Here are the steps for the queen. She's coming off the boat. A queen would be known if the world were stripped of subjects. The very trees and frozen mountains would bow down to you, Your Majesty. I can well imagine. Body of me, I could wish the clouds would stoop less to their queen in my native land. Oh, one forgets how rank dismal this Scotland can be. Dismal? Traitor. Have you never plucked a gowan in spring? A fairy green gowan? Oh, is there spring here in this heathenish climate? They are sweeter than in France, as I recall. And all fruits are sweeter here. Of those that grow. And the summer's sweeter. Ah, they're short enough, in faith. <laughs> and when they come, they will bring excellent devices of masks and ornaments to deceive the eye. And soft words and perfumes to cumber the senses of mankind. Who is this man? Jigmasters and the like will come in authority with Mary Stuart. And the council will be whining and carousing the flowers and fruits of evil. Surely this is some jest, sir. Surely this is not said in welcome to me. And what other welcome shall we give the woman of Babylon? The leprous and cankerous evangel of the devil. Stand back. Your Majesty, they're preparing a room at the inn. The chair will be here at once. If you would deign to take my cloak for your shoulder. Thank you. I wish to speak to this gentleman. This is Master John Knox, of whom your grace may have heard. Nay, then I have heard of him, and I wish to speak to him. Master Knox, it is true that I am Mary Stuart and your queen. And I have come back from France after many years away to take up my rule in this country. It is true, too, that I am sad to leave the south and the sun. And I come here knowing that I shall meet with difficulties that would daunt many older and wiser than I am. For I am young and inexperienced. And perhaps none too adept in statecraft. Yet this is my native, native place, Master Knox. And I loved it as a child and still love it. And whatever I may lack in experience, whatever I may have too much of youth, I shall try to make up for if my people will help me in tolerance and mercy and a quick eye for wrongs and a quick hand to right them. Hey, they told me you spoke, honey. Your Majesty, if the old goat has said anything that needs retracting... He shall retract nothing in fear. I will have all men my friends in Scotland. Can we not be friends, Master Knox? Your Majesty, I have said what I came to say. But you no longer mean it. See, I give you my hand, Master Knox. It is a queen's hand and fair. And I look at you out of honest eyes, and I mean well and fairly. You cannot refuse me. Do you still hesitate? It is clean. Your Majesty. And will you come to see me at Holyrood House and give me counsel? For heaven knows I shall need it. And I shall listen. That I promise. I will come. I will send for you and soon. Good night, Your Majesty. Good night, Master Knox. Now I wonder, will he hate me more or less? More, probably. However, it's just as well to have him where he can watch him. You're an outspoken man yourself, Captain. I am. You will forgive me, but so far I have not heard your name. The Captain is James Hepburn, Madame. The Earl of Bothwell. Ah, you fought ably for my mother. I have been of some slight service here and there. You have indeed. Tell me, my lord of Bothwell, have I done well so far? Shall I not make this Scotland mine? Madam, it is a cold, dour, sour, villainous country. And the folk on it are a cold, dour, sour lot of close-shaving villains. And I can only hope no harm will come here to that bonny face of yours. And no misery to the spirit you bring. <laughs> now here's a new kind of courtesy. You'll hear far and wide I'm no courtier, madam. But I have eyes, and I can see that the new sovereign is a comely lass, and a keen one. And I was for her from the first I saw her face. But from my heart, I could wish you a better country to rule over. Enough. Solemnly and truly, sir, it may be that they are not a happy race. But they have beliefs. And what they believe, they believe from the heart. Why, even this master knocks He, he, he believes whatever is to his own advantage. He split the country wide open over your coming and leads the pack against you. We'll have bloodshed over it yet. Bloodshed? And plenty. No. If I thought that, I should turn now and bid the mariners hoist sail and put back for France. I shall win. But I shall win in a woman's way, not by the sword. Let us hope so. Hope so? But I shall. I am no courtier, madam. I say, let us hope so. Thank you. 
so Mary Stuart began her reign in Scotland. Meanwhile, in the court in London, the jealous Queen Elizabeth of England begins to plot the downfall of the young sovereign. You said, Lord Burley, you had made some memoranda in regard to Mary Stuart. They are not in order, but the main points are covered. First, Mary Stuart has crossed from France to Scotland against your advice and without your safe conduct. Yes. Second, she has been crowned Queen of Scotland. This also against your wish and in defiance of your policy. Yes. Third, she is next heir after your majesty to the throne of England and is held by some to be the rightful Queen of England at the present time. Out with it, then. What must be done? She must be defeated. Truly, but not so quick. Not so quick with wars and troops and expenses. Have you no better counsel? In all my reading, I have found no case of a sovereign deposed without violence. My lord. My lord, it is hard to thrust a queen from her throne. But suppose a queen were led to destroy herself. Led carefully from one step to another in a long descent. Until at last she stood condemned among her own subjects. Baron of royalty, stripped of force. And the people of Scotland were to deal with her for us. Can, can this be done? She is a woman, remember, and open to attack as a woman. We shall set tongues wagging about her. And since it may be true that she is of a keen and noble mind, let us take care of that too. Let us marry her to a weakling and a fool. A woman's mind and spirit are no better than those of the man she weds. She will hardly marry to our convenience, madam. Oh, not if she were aware of it. You have thought of someone? She is seen much with the Earl of Bothwell. I have thought of Darnley. But after herself, Lord Darnley is in fact heir to the English throne. The better, the better. He is handsome and a good bearing. Yes. And a fool. A boasting, drunken boy. If I give out that I am determined against it, she will marry him. And he will drag her down, turn her people against her, make her a fool in council, spoil her beauty. I tell you, a queen who marries is no queen. A woman who marries is a puppet, and she will marry him. But uh, this will take time. It will take many years. I can wait. And we shall need many devices. You shall not find me lacking in devices. In the word to drop here, the rumor started there. It will grow up about her in whispers that she is tainted in blood. She will be known as double-tongued, a demon with an angel's face, a prophetess of evil. Her own people will rise and take her scepter from her. Oh, but your majesty, you... However, I am not to appear in this. Always and above all, I am to seem her friend. Her... You would say that I am in myself more nearly what will be said of her. No, no, I, no. Perhaps. But that is not what is said of me. Whatever I may be, it shall be said only that I am the Queen of England and that I rule well. <laughs> With expert prompting from Elizabeth in England, the court of Scotland fast becomes involved in a morass of lies, deceits, and petty intrigue. Lord Darnley, vapid of countenance, vain in bearing, has already begun to press his favor with Mary, Queen of Scots. Mistress Beaton, is it true that our sovereign is inaccessible this day? Quite true, I fear, my Lord Darnley. Oh, heaven help the man who tries to woo a queen. Lord Darnley is to remain within call. It is Her Majesty's pleasure. Oh, well, that's something. Oh, my Lord Bothwell. I see my name's remembered, and that's a triumph. Tell the sweet Queen Lord Bothwell would see her alone. Sir, she's closeted with her secretary. We're not free to speak with her. Closeted? So? I like not that word, closeted. Who is there here can speak with her and tell her? My Lord, she has faced this day off into hours. So many to each, and... I fear your name is not scheduled. I've been sloughed off much the same way, my lord. Run along, then. And practice wearing that tin sword you got hung on you before it trips you. Trips me? Aye, run and play. This one's been used. The nicks along the edge were made on tougher than you. Tell my lady queen I wish to see her. Now. My orders are strict, my lord. Her majesty has great problems of state. And they concern me more than some others. Now I've argued enough with women, and women faced men. 
A room's a room and a door's a door. Shall I enter without warning or will you announce me to her? Your Majesty. I will speak with my lord alone. Yes, Your Majesty. Do I find you angry? Ah, yet these pests and midges. But you saw me yesterday. I have been standing since this early morning. I and some hundred crows out in a coppice on the cliff's edge, waiting for the smoke to rise from your breakfast chimney. And by the Lord, these crows are a funny company. I've had four full hours to study them. You come to tell me this? I come to tell you I've never shown such patience for a woman. Not in my life before. When I would see my girl, why, I must see her. Your girl? Give me leave since I'm a queen with a kingdom to reign over to queen it once in a while. I tell you truly, I've the manners of a rook. For we're all crows here, and that's what's understood in this town. But I could be tame and split my tongue with courtly speeches if I could be sure of you. If I could know from one day to another what to make of your ways. You shut yourself up with secretaries and ministers, harking for weeks on end to that truffle, while I perch me on the rocks and look my eyes out. Mm-hmm. When I was but 13, a pretty lad fell in love with me. He'd come all oh, afternoons, late midnight, early dawn, sopping with dewfall. He'd stand there waiting for a glance. I've never had such tribute. This is no boy. This is a man comes beating your door in now. It may be you're too young to know the difference, but it's time you learn. You've had your way, my lord. We've spoken, though I had no time to give. And now with your pardon... You'll go about the business of marrying someone else. I cannot marry you. I beg you. Ask it not, speak not of it. Let me go now. They've made a slave of you, this half-brother of yours, this fox of a Maitland, this doddering Chatelero. What they'd like best of all is to wreck you, break you completely, rule the country themselves. And why they fear me is because I'm your man alone and man enough to stop them. Yes, you are man enough. It's dangerous to be honest with you, my boss, but honest I'll be. Since I've been woman grown, there's been no man save you, but I could take his hand steadily in mine and look in his eyes steadily, too, and feel in myself more power than I felt in him. All but yourself. There is aching fire between us, fire that could take deep hold and burn down all the marches of the West and make us great or slay us. Yet it's not to be trusted. Our minds are not the same. If I gave my hand to you, I should be pledged to rule by wrath and violence, to take without denial and mount on others' ruin. That's your way, and it's not mine. You'll find no better way. There's no other way for this nation of churls and cravens. Here you strike first or die. Your brother Murray seeks your death. Elizabeth of England seeks your death, and they work together. Nay, you mistrust too much. God, help me, child. Be staunch to me. You have been staunchest of all. Let me not lose your arm, no, nor your love. You know how much you have of mine. I'm here alone, made queen in a set, hard, bitter time. Aid me and not hinder. So it shall be. Lady dear, do you use guile on me? (laughs) No, sweet. I love thee. And I could love thee well. Go now and leave me. We've been seen too much together. You must lay this hand in no one's else. It's mine. I have but lease on it myself. It's not my own. But it would be yours if it were mine to give. And now, to Mary's court comes an ambassador from England in the person of Lord Throgmorton, whose purpose is to trick the Scottish Queen into marriage with Lord Darnley. Come down to earth and speak without swaggering. What is it that Elizabeth would have me do? There is some hope, Your Majesty, that when you seek a husband, you will not do so to bolster up your claim to the English crown. Mm. That had not occurred to me. But surely your choice in marriage will imply your attitude. I have no intention of fighting my troth at once. But if I had, I've received enough advice already on that point. A mort of it. And I'm tender. Say no more, madam. And I will say no more. Oh, out with it now. Give me the advice. I won't take it. Uh, Why, um, you see, Your Majesty, Elizabeth had a fear of this. The young Lord Darnley has come north against her will. Why he's here, we don't know. Nor whether by invitation or 
What plans do you have concerning him? I have none. Uh, then if you will, forget what I have said. It was only that this Darnley combines to exactness what Elizabeth dreads in case you marry. After you, he's next to her throne. And uh, if you had a son, why, he'd be heir to England. And I think the plain fact is that Elizabeth would rather choose her own heir. Now, oh, heaven forgive me. I am heir to the throne of England. And after me, whatever children I have, is it part of her love to cut me off from my right? In brief, my queen has wished that you might choose Bothwell or perhaps some and other. And that's the message. We're down to it at last. Lord Throckmorton, I marry where I please, whether now or later. And I abate not one jot of my good blood lean on the English throne. Nay, I shall rather strengthen it if mm, I can. This will hardly please. I can hardly expect it would. But I, too, am a power, and it matter what pleases me. This was all? Uh, this is all I am commissioned with. I shall see to your safe conduct. <laughs> Yes? Will your majesty see a gentleman calling himself Lord Bothwell? He's in again. There's no keeping him out. The doxy invited me in herself. You may go, Beaton. Yes. Lord, I have heard from England. Mary McQueen, what you heard I could have guessed. She's a demon. She bodes you ill. I believe it now. Oh, would heaven I'd been born deep somewhere in the highlands and there met you. A maid in your path, and you but a highland bowman who needed me. Why, if you love me, Marie, you're my maid and I your soldier. And it won't be. Aye, it will be. Look, Bothro, I'm a sovereign and you obey no one. Were I married to you, you'd be king here in Edinburgh. And I'd have no mind to your ruling. They'll beat you alone. Together we could cope them. Love you, I may. Love you, I have. But not now and no more. It's for me to rule, not you. I'll deliver up no land to such a hothead. If you'd been born to the blood, I'd say, I take it. The heavens had a meaning in this. The royal blood's in me. I will have no master. Nay, I am jealous of this, my Stuart blood. Jealous of what it has meant in Scotland. Jealous of what it may mean. They've attacked that blood and I'm angry. They'll meet more anger than they know. And who has angered you? Not I. Elizabeth. I thought so. She's afraid, if I'm half a prophet, that you'll marry me. No, her fears run the other way. She's afraid I'll marry Darnley and threaten her throne, and so I might. Will you tell me what that means? I mean, if I have a son, he'll govern England. And so he might, if he were mine, too. Nay, might. But it must be. She dares to threaten my heritage. Does that mean Lord Darnley? Aye, lady, will you stoop so low to choose a weapon? This is not worthy of the girl I've known. Am I to be ousted by a pape, Jay? An end of moldy string? You take too much on yourself for the future. Think of us. And the hours close on us here we might have together. Leave something to the gods in heaven. They look after, lover. Oh, what's a little love? A trick of the eyes, a liking to be set beside the name you'll have forever or your son will have? You don't offer enough, Lord Buffel. You're not true in it. And I'm not true to myself and what I feel for you. I'm no lute player to languish and write sonnets when my lady says me nay. But when the tug begins around your throne, you'll be lost without me. Try no threats toward England. It will tax a hardy man all his time to hold what you have. We differ there, too. What I have, I'll defend for myself. If you marry this Darnley, I take away my hand. <laughs> Before heaven, he believes he's held me up so far. And then I'd fall without him. I believe it, and it's true. Darnley, no miracle could make him a king. He's a fool, and he'll rule like a fool. We shall see, Lord Bothell. Well, I'm sped. My suit's cold. But by heaven, lady, Darnley, he sticks in my craw. I can't go him. Will you learn, Lord Bothell, that this is not your palace, but mine? Or must you be taught that lesson? There's been a bond between us. We'll find it hard to forget. You may. Not I. I've set my face where I'm going. Lass. Lass, God thee. You've seen the last of me. I've given no leave for departure, Lord Bothwell. I need no leave. No leave taking. You see no more of me. <laughs> Here in 
Hollywood, there's an apartment house with a view of the hills from the windows. On the top floor lives Miss Jane C., who came to Hollywood a year ago and is now an extra over at the Paramount Studios. Today, she's home early to greet a friend just arrived from New York. Let's listen in. It's a break that Betty's away, so you can use this bedroom the whole two weeks you're here. There, I, I've cleaned out the top drawers there, and there's room in the closet. Oh, thanks, darling. I'll hang my dresses up right away. We can talk while I unpack. Heavens, this bag was stuffed and something's dropped on the floor. I'll get it. Oh, it's, it's under the bed. Here it is. Wait. Well, there's two of them. Three of them. For Pete's sake. Lux toilet soap. Certainly, darling. Never go anywhere without it. No cosmetic skin for little Nettie. You know, unless cosmetics are thoroughly removed... You're explaining to me, and mm -hmm. after I've been in Hollywood for a year. Well, Nettie, old girl, I'll have to hand it to you. We may be able to tell you something out here about how movies are made and show you the coconut grove or the brown derby, but we're not going to be able to tell you a thing about smart complexion care. It's because Lux Toilet Soap has active lather that it guards so effectively against cosmetic skin, little blemishes, enlarged pores, dullness. It carries away every trace of dust, dirt, stale rouge, and powder. Use it before you put on fresh makeup. Always before you go to bed. Use it regularly. You'll learn why nine out of ten screen stars use it. At home in their own luxurious bathrooms and in their studio dressing rooms as well. Now... Back to Mr. DeMille. Joan Crawford, Francho Tone, and Judith Anderson return to us now in Mary of Scotland. An evening in the year 1566. Mary has been married to Lord Darnley for only a year, but already the vicious actions of the new king have reflected on the throne. The web of lies surrounding Mary has grown stronger. Malicious tongues have linked her name falsely with that of Rizzio, her secretary. In a hall in the palace, Mary is seated near the great heart. Rizzio and the ladies-in-waiting form a circle about her. Mary is sad, and Rizzio knows the reason. Oh, my lady, I shall never forgive myself. I favored Lord Darnley, and he's our weakness, not our strength. None could have known that. I should have known. Bothwell would have been better. Bothwell? Aye, Bothwell. He'd have held them off. Uh, there's no trifling with him. Let's have no talk of Bothwell. He's better away. The country's been much quieter since he left it, hasn't it, madam? Much quieter. You'll have a child, Your Majesty. You'll have an heir, and then you'll be happier. With Donnelly's child? Oh, he will change, too. The man changes when there are children. We must hope so. His Majesty will return tomorrow? He was to have returned three days ago, but the hunting may have been delayed. We may expect him soon. You... Your Majesty, I I have a request which you have denied before, but which I must make again. It is necessary for me to leave Scotland. Rizzio. No, I grow lonely for Italy. We know why, Rizzio, and I won't have it. I won't have my friends driven from me. I think it best. Has His Majesty spoken to you? Lonely, by the way. Oh, I'm not wanted here. You know that. The king is full of these whims and fancies, my dear Rizzio. If I gave way to one, I should have to humor him in all. You and I know that I'm quite innocent with you, and you with me. And I can't spare you. Majesty, I... I tell you honestly, it's torture to speak of going away, and yet... Oh, I want no harm to come to you through me. And none will. The king is jealous of everyone, Maurizio. Everyone I see or have seen. It's a brain-sick notion. I know that he has acted and spoken foolishly in many such matters. But as for danger, there is none. Uh, I hope there is none. His Majesty? My Lord. I'm unexpected, perhaps. Too early. A thought too early. I'll retire. Come when I'm wanted. No, my Lord. You've been long expected and more than welcome. Why, a pretty wife. A housewife with her maid. <laughs> a pretty sight. And maybe a cavalier or two... For the maid's company. Don't sit you down, all. I'll not intrude. I'll take my leave, my lady. Yes. No, stay. Stay, Rizzio. I'm the one to go, it seems. You're tired, my lord. Will you wish some service, something to eat or drink? She sends me off to bed, you note. You noted, Rizzio. My lord, 
I hoped you would have some other word for me when you returned. I think if I gave you the word you've earned, you wouldn't stay to hear it. Rivon! Rivon! What is this? You will retire, Sire. Who are you? My good friend, Rivon. Is this a place for armor? I will receive Lord Riven another time. The gallant's there, Riven. Hey. This is my apartment, sir, and I ask you to go. Not yet, Miss Sweet. Lord Douglas comes here, too. I demand little courtesy, but that little I must have. Are these your friends? If so, take them elsewhere. Why? I'm to have my friends in my apartment, and you're to have yours here. That fellow Rizzo with the kinked hair there. That's he, the one we have in question. He, he, I tell you, that Italian spawn. Your Majesty. Take him. No, Lord Douglas, Riven. Whatever you have in hand here, put no faith in this king I've crowned and set beside me. His word is a paper shield. I'm king in this country, mistress, and I know my right. Let me pass. Nay, lads, my sword says me. Take him, my queen. Try, We'll take care of him. No, no. <laughs> Douglas, I'll remember this. <laughs> Murdered him. You pack of filthy cowards. Yeah, and done well. Done well. Oh, fools and cowards. Oh, Rizzio, Rizzio. It was I wouldn't let you go. You might cover that sight. Is he dead, Rizzio? Yes, madam. Oh, you do well. You do well, all of you. You shall answer for this. There'll be no answering. We know what we know about you. You pitiful dolt. To think such a calf should rule, and at my choosing... God may forgive you, not I, and Rizzio. Take yourselves out. You pollute the dead to stand there. Come, we've done our work. And well done, too. Rizzio. Rizzio. He wanted to go to Italy. Madam, take care. The blood will stain your dress. Oh, if that were all. This blood will bring more blood after. Now I see... Before I reign here, clearly there will be many men lie so for me. Slain in needless quarrel. Slain, and with each one with blood to spill but once, like his. Oh, I tell you, beaten, my soul is aghast at this blood spilled for me. And yet it hardens me, too. These are their manners. This is the way they go to work. I shall work on them, and not too lightly. They think of me as a girl, afraid of them. They shall see. And yet my mind believes nothing of what I say. I'm weak as grief stripped and wept out before them. Your Majesty, there's someone here who would speak with you. Let no one enter. No one... In all this kingdom, I can trust but five, and one's myself. And we're women, all of us. But he's from France, and says that he has news. From France? What is his name? He gave me this token for you. No name. It's a crow's feather. Tell my Lord Bothwell I have no wish to see him now or later. Oh, madam, you'll see him. I brought him along with me. Your Majesty... Your Majesty, you've had unwelcome company this hour, if I've heard the right. And I care not to be another. But I come to make an offer I made before. To be your soldier. I have no time to talk, Lord Bothwell. Nor do I wish to see you. The time has gone by. My queen, turn not away your friends. You're few enough. Too few, it seems, to prevent what's happened. Oh, go now. I'm not unkind. But I'm cut off from you. You know that. I... There was no need to hide your weeping. He was over young to die. It's not for him. No, it, it's for all I wanted my life to be and is not. Majesty, you have a fortunate star. It will come well yet. If I have a star at all, it's an evil one. To violate my room, kill my servant before my eyes. Oh, how I must be hated. They'll pay for that. Perhaps. I've taken an oath they'll pay for it. Your Majesty, I wearied of France and exile, wearied of the sun and wine, and looked north over the water, longing for fog and heather in my own country. Further, the news was none too happy from Scotland. They want your throne and plan to have it. But I mean to live in this land and mean you to be queen of it. The Earl of Bothwell is home and spoiling for a fight. Before day dawns, they'll hear from me. 
Lord, I thank you. Give me no thanks. I like a fight too well to pretend it's a virtue. You have no army. I have my bordermen. Lord Huntley's joined with me in his Highland kilties. If you'd call your clans, we could drive them to the wall. It's a war, then. It's war already. They've turned your Darnley against you. They'll use him as long as they need his seal. It's in the wind. This Darnley has not long to live. I'd have no hand in that, nor you. Lady, I need you and you need me. But I'll be cursed if Darnley's needed on this earth. You have never yet learned how to take an order. And never will, from man or woman living, sovereign or knave. I have not been conquered and will not be. But I offer you my loyalty, and it's worth the more for that. You should be my Lord Admiral and act for me. Yes. And to that, let me add how my breath caught when I knew you were here. Hoping, I know not what, things not to be, hopes I must strangle down. Oh, Bothwell. Bothwell, I was wrong. I loved you all the time and denied you. Forgive me, even too late. I tell you, we shall be happy yet. No, for I think I've been at the top of what I'll have. And all the rest is going down. You're weary. You've born too much. They shall pay for this. Come no nearer, my lord. It's not ours to have. Go now. Yes, your majesty. Yet I tell you, we shall be happy. And there will be nothing not ours to have. The Earl of Bothwell's prophecy came true, in part. For Donnelly was mysteriously murdered. And some months after his death, the Queen and Bothwell were married. But their happiness was short-lived, for rumors again beset the throne. Rumors that Bothwell himself had murdered the king and, and set himself up in his place. Scotland was split in two, and the nobles arrayed themselves in battle against their sovereign. At a parley in Dunbar Castle, Murray, the queen's half-brother, addresses the vanquished Earl of Bothwell. We have little to gain, Lord Bothwell, by a conference with you. The battle is ours. The queen is prisoner to us. But to spare ourselves further bloodshed, and spare you bloodshed, we grant this respite and ask that you surrender without conditions. No. No, I thank you. Moreover, Murray, if your tongue's to be foremost in this council, we'll stop now and argue the matter outside. Be patient, my lord. We are here to make terms, as you are, both well. The queen and you have been defeated. We made war on you because you two were married. And because she planned to make ye king. You make war on us like the pack of lying hounds you are by swearing in public and in court that we killed Darnley so that we might marry. You won with that lie. May your mouth rot out with it. And now, what do you want? What do you ask of us? First, that ye leave Scotland. That's easily said. What else? Why, next, that the queen should delegate her powers to the lords of the council. Those you see before you. I, I see them. And bind herself to act with our consent only. No more? No more. Then here are my conditions. I will leave and trouble you no more if you pledge your word that the queen's to keep her throne and her power intact without prejudice to her rights. But if you dare encroach one inch on her sovereignty, guard your gates, for I'll be at them. Aye, you make your turn. Aye, I make mine. Defeated, I still make mine, and you'll do well to heed them. I shall want leave also to see the queen for a moment. You know our answer. Then look to yourselves. Take his terms, my Murray. Are we to fight a war and win and toss the spoils away? Find some agreement, for I'm in haste. And if you say no to me, I've other plans. I say let him go and leave her the throne. And if you do, this sword stays in the scabbard. And lucky for all of you. You give your pledge... Lord Maitland. I give my pledge, Lord Bothwell, for all here present. We have not rebelled against the Queen and will not. If you are banished... Then give me leave to speak alone with her. With the Queen? Aye, for a moment. Thank God you're safe. And you are safe, my Queen. Safe and set free and may keep your kingdom. At what price? They made a bargain with me. God knows whether they'll keep it, but I think they will, for Maitland gave his word and he's been honest. What bargain? You've sacrificed yourself for this. What have you offered? Nothing to weigh against what you'll keep. 
I've given my earldom. That's a trifle to what we say. Oh, you shall have it back and more to put with it. No. I've accepted exile. I'm to leave the kingdom. Why, then, I'm exiled, too. I'm your wife, and I love you, Bothwell. The bargain's made. You may keep your crown without me, but not with me. Do you abdicate your throne? What's left? Call in the men of your guard. Cut our way through and ride. They'll never hit us. We can rouse the north, ask help from France and England, return with an army they dare not meet. You would raise no army, Marie. You forget what a drag I am on you. The north is sullen to the south toward you and me. What's left, we must do apart. What if we lost? At the worst, we'd have each other. And do you vision the end of that? A woman who was a queen. A man who was the earl, her husband. Fugitives put to it to ask for food and lodging. Enemies on every road. They, weary, heartsick, turning at last on each other with reproaches. She saying, I was a queen, would be one now but for you. And he, I have lost my earldom. Well, I betrayed you once and betrayed my love. But I learned by that. I swear, though it cost my kingdom, not again. If you wish to thrive, break that oath. Betray me, betray your love. Give me up forever. For you know, as I know, we lose together. God knows what will ever win apart. Nothing. Oh, Bothwell, the earth goes empty. What worse could happen than parting? Can I stay? This once for the last I can save you from yourself and me. There's something wills it. I go alone. This is your kingdom. Rule it. You must not surrender. They'd serve you as they served Don. I'll not surrender. I'll see to my own banishment. Find my guard. Force my way out and go. We must say goodbye. Bye, girl. We've spent what time we had, and I know not when I'll see you. Let's have no pretense unworthy of us. It's likely we'll not meet again on this same star. God help me and all women here in this world, and all men. And let all women and men drink deep while they can their happiness. It goes fast and never comes again. Face these lords like a queen, and rule like a queen. I'd help you if I could, but I'm no help. You must meet them now. Yes, I'll meet them. Can you break your way through? They're watching. It's a chance. Huntley. Huntley. I'm here. We ride at once for Sterling. Be ready for a fight. We're ready. I must take my moment. I know. Goodbye, sweet. But if they wrong you, if you ever need me, Look for me back. Goodbye to our two worlds. Our horses, Huntley. Turn them on. Away, then. Waste no time. Who's there? It's Bothwell. Bothwell, hit him off. Uncle. Pistol him. Pistol him. Well, brother. The Earl of Bothwell. Has he gone? He has. You sent him off. That was your ruse. Lord Bothwell will leave Scotland. That was what you wanted. Lord Murray, he's escaped. Hey, clean away. Madam, collect what necessities you require. You will change your residence. That is at my will, I think. You think so? You're to be lodged in Holyrood House for the time. I'm to be lodged. And your fate... You pledged your faith and word, all of you, to leave my power untouched. Leave me my throne if Bothwell and I were parted. We'll keep it when Lord Bothwell surrendered to us. Go out and take him. Go out and take him if you can. But for your queen, I warn you, never since there were kings and queens in Scotland has a liegeman laid hand on my line without regret. What you need, gather it quickly. This is betrayal at once of your word and sovereign. Eh, we know that. I need nothing. Your Majesty. I am a prisoner beaten. Come after me to Holyrood House. I may have my own room there, Lord Maitland. Yes, madam. You show great courtesy for a liar and traitor. You lied to us, a black and level lie. Blackest and craftiest. It was you we believed. I, sister. It was that we counted on. I, brother. 
Station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Kate. Mary of Scotland, starring Joan Crawford, Francho Tone, with Judith Anderson, is resumed in a moment. In the 16th century, when our play was be being enacted in real life, among the closest advisors of Queen Elizabeth were the Earl of Warwick his younger brother, the Earl of Leicester, and Leicester's son, Essex. Tonight, it's my honor to introduce the present Earl of Warwick, member of a family which for centuries has been among the most distinguished in the British, British Empire, nephew of Anthony Eden, England's foreign secretary, our guest recently arrived in Hollywood. Here, under the name of Michael Brook, he makes his debut shortly as a motion picture actor. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Guy Fulk Greville, Baron Brook, and seventh Earl of Warwick. Thank you, Mr. DeMille, but think of what time you'd save if you called me just Mike, or at least Michael Brooks. I'll take that advice, Mike. Queen Elizabeth doesn't fare so well in tonight's play. Do you think we do her an injustice? All I can say, Mr. DeMille, is that Elizabeth did what she thought best for England, just as Mary did what she thought best for Scotland. My ancestors, as you said, were rather close to Elizabeth. About ten miles from my home in England is Kenilworth Castle, which many of you will recall from Sir Walter Scott's novel, Elizabeth gave Kenilworth the Earl of Leicester. And they'd visit there quite frequently, and often come over to my home. As a matter of fact, I still sleep on what was called Elizabeth's bed. It's a fine old bed with enough room for five people, if we ever get crowded. I also have a fiddle. When she owned it, it was about 200 years old. So today, it's really an antique. It's beautifully carved, and in spite of its ripe old age, can still be played. Do you have any of Queen Mary's belongings? No, but I've seen several. There's a house near mine which belongs to the Throckmortons. I've been there many times. They own one of the garments worn by Queen Mary when she met her death. Also near Warwick at Salgrave is the ancestral home of George Washington. And Shakespeare's birthplace at Stratford. Shakespeare was alive at the time of your play tonight. It's a great romantic age, though many things were terribly crude. To put it bluntly, it was an age of awful smells. In fact, a gentleman protected himself by carrying a gold or silver ball around his neck filled with perfumes which he could sniff whenever the going got rather tough. Women used lots of cosmetics, which had such funny names as fat of swans, serpentine of a basil, and one which might interest you, Mr. DeMille, called soap of cypress. But I dare say they'd have given its weight in gold for a cake of luxe toilet soap. It's a splendid soap. I took along several cartons on an expedition I made in 1935 through Russia, Persia, Afghanistan, and into India. One of the comforts I didn't like to leave behind. I don't blame you. After a trip like that, Mr. Brook, even Hollywood must seem rather a dull place. On the contrary, it's one of the world's most fascinating communities. Certainly the only place where one can learn the motion picture business. I'd like to stay here four or five years, acting and learning, and then perhaps I'll be able to make some better pictures at home. Uh, too bad that you're unable to attend the coronation. I regret it tremendously. I know this program is frequently heard across the ocean and all over England. Although I can't be there on Wednesday, I can at least say what's in my heart. God save the king. In which sentiment, I'm sure we all join you. <laughs> Mary of Scotland, starring Joan Crawford and French Tone with Judith Anderson. <laughs> Escaping from her enemies in Scotland, Mary fled to England. Fled to certain doom at the hands of another enemy, Elizabeth. The jealous English queen was quick to seize her advantage. Mary was imprisoned in Carlisle Castle, there to await for help, which never came. In her room, the exiled sovereign turns from her barred window as the heavy door swings open. I have seen but a poor likeness, and yet I believe this is Elizabeth. I am Elizabeth. May we be alone? Beaten. Yes, sure, Lord. I had hoped to see you. When last you wrote, you were not sure. If I've come so doubtfully and with slow step, it's not for lack of thinking of you. Rather because I've thought too long, perhaps, and carefully. Then at last it seemed, if I saw you near and we talked as sisters over these poor realms of ours, 
Some light might break that we'd never see apart. Can it be as I've hoped? Can it be that you've come to me as a friend, meaning me well? Would you have me an enemy? I have plenty to choose among as enemies. What I seek now is only my freedom, so that I may return and prove an open court and before my witnesses that I'm guiltless. You are the Queen of England, and I'm held prisoner in England. Why am I held? And who is it holds me? It was to my interest, child, to protect you. Lest violence be offered to a princess and set a precedent. You wish me here? You wish me in prison? Have we come to that? It's safer and better for both our kingdoms if you remain my guest. For how long? Until the world is quieter. And who will rule in my place? For I, who rules now? Your brother. Elizabeth, I have been here a long while already. If it's your policy to keep me, shut me up, I can argue no more. No, no, I beg now. There's one I love in the North, you know that. And my life's there, my throne's there, my name to be defended. And I must lie here, darkened from news and from the sun. Lie here impaled on a brain's agony. Then be advised. And sign your abdication. Stay now a moment. I begin to glimpse behind this mask of yours. It was this you wanted from the first. This what I wanted. Why, I'm no witch to charm you. I make no incantations. You came here by your own road. I see how I came. Back, back each step the wrong way. And each sign followed as you'd have me go. It was you who forced Bothwell from me. You there and always. Your life was a threat to mine. Your throne to my throne. Your policy a threat. And you'd take my life and love to avoid this threat? Nay, keep your life and your love too. The lords have brought a parchment for you to sign. Sign it and live. And if I will not sign this abdication? You've tasted prison. Try a diet of it. And so I will. I can wait. And I can wait. I can better wait than you. Bothwell will fight free again. Kirkcaldy will fight beside him. And others will spring up from these dragon's teeth you've sown. Each week that passes, I'll be stronger and Murray weaker. I wait for Bothwell and wait for him here. Child, child. I studied this gambit before I played it. I will send each year this paper to you. Not signing, you will step from one cell to another. Step lower always till you reach the last. Forgotten. Forgotten of men. Forgotten among causes. Wait then for Bothwell's rescue. It will never come. I'm, I may never see him. Never. It would not be wise. And suppose indeed you won within our lifetime. They still will find you out. Win now. Take your triumph now, for I'll win men's hearts in the end. Though the sifting takes this hundred years or a thousand. Child, child, are you gulled by what men write in histories? This or that are never true. It's not what happens that matters, but what men believe to have happened. They will believe the worst of you, the best of me. And still I win. A demon has no children, and you have none, will have none, can have none, perhaps. Leave me here and set me lower this year by year as you promised. Still, still, I win. I have been a woman, and I've loved as a woman loves, lost as a woman loses. I have borne a son, and he will rule Scotland and England. You have no heir. A devil has no children. By heaven, you shall suffer for this. But slowly. And that I can do. A woman can do that. Come, turn the key. I have a hell for you in mind, where you will burn and feel it. Live where you like and softly. Once more I ask you, and patiently, give up your throne. No, devil. My pride is stronger than yours, and my heart beats blood such as yours has never known. And in this dungeon... I win here alone. Then, good night. Aye, good night. Beaten. 
You will not see your maids again, I think. It's said they bring you news from the north. I thank you for all kindness. Year after year, the fateful missive came. Year after year, with head held high, the exiled queen refused to sign. Until at last, another document arrived. One with no need of Mary's name to make its fatal clauses binding. This, then, my good lord, is the warrant? The warrant for your death, my lady. Signed by Elizabeth. And by her, my fate is sealed. And yet not death. For I have died these 20 years a thousand deaths. With each one worse than that which went before. I welcome then these tidings. And I pray to God the end of all my bitter suffering is at hand. Tell your queen, my lord, that I am ready. Many years before, Mary, Queen of Scots, had embroidered six words upon a piece of linen. Six simple words which were, in my end is my beginning. Our play, ladies and gentlemen, is done. <laughs> Leaving the royalty of ancient Scotland and England... We bring you the royalty of modern Hollywood and the stage in a brief interlude with our stars, Joan Crawford, Francho Tone, and Judith Anderson. It's rather difficult to be original, ladies and gentlemen. And what you, what you want most of all to say is simply thank you. I think you might express our appreciation of the Lux Radio Theater, Joan. That's right. But personally, I feel indebted not only to the Lux Radio Theater but also to Lux Toilet Soap. Well, I was coming to that, Judith. I think everyone should at least try Lux Toilet Soap. And if they're like me, they'll keep on using it. After all, it's the easiest thing in the world to have a smooth, healthy complexion when you let Lux Toilet Soap take care of it for you. And certainly there's no doubt that a lovely complexion is very important to women. That's exactly the way I feel, Joan. Mr. DeMille, what are we going to listen to? The Lux Radio Theater next Monday night. A play, Joan that has a particular message and a particular appeal to every family. Maybe you saw it on the screen or when it was entertaining capacity crowds on Broadway. It has a compelling honesty and a simple love story that I'm sure will keep you all very close to your loudspeakers. The title, Another Language, and starring in it will be Betty Davis, Fred McMurray, and John Beale. <laughs> the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Davis, Fred McMurray, and John Beale in another language. As a special guest of honor, you will hear also from the mother of our president, Mrs. James Roosevelt, Mrs. Cecil B. DeMille, saying good night to you from Hollywood. Word of appreciation to those who were with us in the cast tonight. Edward Cooper as John Knox, Kenneth Hunter as Burley, Vernon Downing as Darnley, Walter Kingsford as Throgmorton, Vernon Steele as Maitland, Leo McCabe as Moray, Phyllis Coglin as Mary Beaton, and James Eagles as Riccio. Announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.